I would like to introduce the moderator for this session on the opportunity in real estate investment trusts or REITs. And it is with special fondness uh, that I introduce S.V. Bala Chandar. I uh, received my CFA charter from Bala at the Charter Award Ceremony a long time back in 2012. And I really could not have wished uh, for a better person to receive my CFA charter from. He is the chairman and CEO of GMN Investments Research. And he has a very strong capital markets background across multiple organizations. Welcome, Bala. Thanks for your time. Over to you. Please kickstart the session once you see your video live on the panel. Thank you for that warm welcome and uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second day of the uh, Fixed Income Conference 2020. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Holland, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Embassy, uh, Embassy Office Parks, India's first listed REIT, which is sponsored by Embassy Group and Blackstone. Embassy REIT listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange in April 2019. In April 2020, the business had a market capitalization in excess of USD 3.5 billion. Uh, Michael has been in the uh, real estate business sector for about 25 years. He was the founder of Jones Lang LaSalle India, and he served as a country manager between 1998 and 2002. Um, Mike has worked in Asia since 1995 and has lived in India for close to two decades. He currently resides in Bangalore. He has served on um, uh, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, South Asia Board, and a member of the Asia Pacific Real Estate Association India Chapter Board. He is also a board member of several charitable organizations with a focus on disability and education. Welcome, Michael. Over the last 12 years, he has focused on real estate investment, uh, investment management, focusing on core and core plus properties in Malaysia, Australia, and Europe. He is the founder and director of Alpha REIT Managers, the investment manager for Alpha REIT, which has been set up to invest in education and education-related properties in Malaysia. Mr. Jayabalan is also the founder of Silver Formula, a new investment platform that will focus on built-to-suit built to properties. He's a member of the Malaysian Institute of Accountants, Malaysian Institute of Chartered Public Accountants, and, a, and the CFA Institute. He's also a member of the Institute of Corporate Directors, Malaysia. Welcome, Jay Balan. Good evening, everyone. Greetings from Kuala Lumpur. So let's uh, get the session started. Michael, I'll hand it over to you for your presentation. And I believe, uh, Jay Balan, you will come after that, and then you will uh, share your uh, thoughts, and then we will get into a discussion and then Q&A after that. Michael, over to you. OK, I'm assuming I'm now audible. And that I think you can see that screen, uh, the cover screen. So I'll proceed on that assumption. So um, Bala, thank you so much uh, for the intro. Thank you, uh, Ravi, for chairing this session. That was one of the nicest introductions I've, I've ever heard, to have a pupil introducing his, uh, his master, if you want that way. So very nice. Uh, nice to be here, appreciate it. So um, as Bala mentioned, uh, I represent uh, a, an, a, a company called Embassy, Tr Embassy REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. We listed in Bombay in April of 2019. So we're uh, just coming up to the end of our seventh quarter post listing. Um, I won't talk today about uh, Embassy REIT pretty much at all. I'm going to talk about uh, REITs in general and in particular in India um, as, a, as an investment platform. Um, there are now two uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts here in India. Um, there's talk of a, a, a third and even fourth that's been reported in the papers. Um, so it's really intended as a background and an opportunity to understand uh, the REIT uh, platform from the ground up and then we can spend as much time as possible on the um, Q&A discussion. I'm just, okay. 
So while REIT is a new uh, concept here in India, it's, it's something that's not new at all um, from around the world. They've been in existence for over 60 years, first in the US, and you can see the timeline, different countries adopting REITs over that period. Um, if, if you see the, the headline at the bottom there, it's a $2 trillion asset class globally, and there are over 400 REITs. Um, I've taken the list of the top 10 entities out of the MSCI uh, US REIT index that you see in the middle there. And the point I want to illustrate on that is there are all sorts of different REITs. So in India, at present, it's only office uh, REITs, uh, whereas in the US, you can see number one, Prologis. That's the world's biggest uh, logistics and warehousing um, REIT. So you have warehousing REITs, Digital Realty Trust um, is a data center uh, REIT around the world. Public storage uh, is, a, is as, as the name uh, suggests, a storage REIT. Simon Property Group is a primarily retail REIT, so shopping malls and so on. Um, and the interesting uh, couple of, uh, there, Avalon Bay and Equity Residential, again, as the name suggests, these are residential REITs. And what they've all got in common is that the trust, the REIT, owns a number of assets, and those assets are generating rental income. And the rental income is going up to the unit holders. So the kind of key takeaway here is it's not a new product internationally. Um, there are many different asset classes that, that are, are covered. And fundamentally, it's about owning assets that are income producing. In uh, the global, globally, if you if you look overseas, um, seventy nine percent of all listed real estate companies in the the the, the major uh, developed markets um, are are REITs, and and half uh, by market cap of those companies are in the REIT space. In, in India, that would be kind of the inverse. We're just at the beginning of the journey. But uh, just, just to underscore and underline, in most developed markets, the REIT model is the overall framework uh, for most um, listed real estate entities. And why, why are the, um, investors attracted to a, a REIT as, a, as a, an opportunity? Um, so one, because they're publicly traded um, in stock markets, just like uh, traditional equities, um, they are significantly more liquid than owning real estate, but, and, and also in terms of scale in which one has to own that. If I pass you the phone, you're going to look at the last of the... Um... I think somebody needs to go on mute, right? Um, so, so the liquidity, um, which is also about the scale at which people can in, can invest, that fractional ownership that's that's there under the asset quality, um, strong governance principles. I would say, particularly the case in 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 India, that SEBI have put together some very um, effective regulations over the REIT, and we'll touch on some of those. Um, again, in, in India the concept that we are required to distribute at least 90% of available cash flows uh, twice a year. Um, our REIT actually does that um, every quarter. Uh, we distribute and we try to distribute close to 100% of uh, available cash uh, to our unit holders. So you've got a nice uh, income uh, uh, type product. Um, and performance, I'll show you uh, some, some comparative performance from different countries around the world, but a good track record uh, in that. So just to quickly understand the framework of the REITs in India, um, internationally, one often has an internal manager, but in Asia, so in Singapore and in India, you have an external manager that stands outside of the trust the trust owns a number of SPVs, each of which in turn own the, 
the properties. Those properties are leased out. And again, I highlight if it was a, an industrial REIT, a logistics REIT, those SPVs would be owned by the trust, just like an office. The rental stream comes up to the REIT. The manager has a manager fee, which I'll, I'll touch on a bit later, um, but the vast majority of that uh, net operating income is then fed back to the uh, unit holders and, and spo the sponsors of uh, the REIT. So the income is coming from those underlying real estate assets. In our REIT and in Indian office REITs, that generally means um, high quality business parks generally let to largely international or and or top tier technology companies uh, here in India. Uh, our properties are in four of the top metros, uh, but essentially great locations, uh, great large scale assets. And of course, the tenant quality is uh, and the covenant of those tenants is really important when you're assessing uh, the appeal of any particular REIT. So we, for example, have over 160 um, companies. I, I think 72% of those companies are international. Half of them are in the technology sector. Um, so if one's assessing the strength of that REIT, you'd look at that uh, the covenant of those tenants and the underlying contracts with those tenants. And that's that lease term um, are those long-term contracts? So can you rely on that for um, a number of years? What's the weighted average lease expiry um, uh, within, within the uh, portfolio? So assessing the quality of the income stream. Uh, and we, we made the point that it's, it's as a REIT in India, this is different in other parts of the world, but in India, 90% of um, the available net distributable cash flow is uh, distributed to, to unit holders. Again, these are the regulations in India. Um, so one, it, it, there is a requirement that at least 80% of the asset base um, is completed and income producing assets. So uh, REITs in India cannot be and are not what one would typically know as a developer, uh, or sometimes people might use the term a builder. It's essentially a trust owning the assets, and those assets are income producing. So beyond that 80%, in the 20% uh, bucket, one is allowed to invest in unlisted real estate securities and development assets. But together, that must not exceed 20%. Um, in India, we're permitted to own um, what we're saying a broadly commercial asset, so offices, hotels, retail, industrial, healthcare, but we are not allowed to own residential uh, and we are not allowed to acquire as, uh, uh, land on a speculative basis. And you see there that leverage restriction. Um, we need unit holder approval if we're going to exceed a 25% uh, uh, debt to GAV, uh, and that is absolutely capped at 49%, even if you have unit holder approval. And my view is that these types of restrictions are very good from an investor perspective. I think SEBI uh, took a number of years to put the regulations together, and the, the, um, the appeal, the attraction of them is the transparency the restrictions that are put there on some of the higher risk elements that go with real estate. So the speculation in land, um, the development asset uh, side, which is generally uh, quite risky. So those, those are what, what one is allowed to invest in under the REIT regs. And these are um, the regulations that we are guided by under SEBI, um, RBI in terms of who can invest and what, whether that's debt or equity, um, and of course under the uh, Indian Trusts Act. So um, SEBI, SEBI regs uh, are, are there on their website. 
we'll we'll touch on some of those but um if you want more detail on that um they're they're they're, they're to be downloaded so here are some of the specifics on the reap framework um i mentioned um the types of assets it must be minimum 80 percent completed and income producing um and again underscoring therefore less risk to the cash flows uh, i mentioned about land and we must distribute uh, those cash flows semi-annually um, i mentioned about the debt cap corporate governance this is a piece that i haven't touched on that's important um, so 50 percent of the representation on all of our committees um, needs to be of our independent directors and when we say independent that means independent to uh, the sponsors in our case that's a blackstone and embassy sponsor uh, it, it, it can be one uh, entity it can be a foreign entity on their own it can be an indian entity on its own but there is a requirement that there is that independent uh, set of directors on the board and on the committees again that's another safeguard which we believe is is good for uh, unrelated unit holders um, the manager can be removed under the reg uh, the the regulations and that's detailed out the process uh, under the sebi regs um, and in terms of related parties that also goes one step further when we're looking at acquiring any potential assets um, if those are uh, have any related party there's a process that we need to go through of independent valuation um, by by two independent valuers there's a cap and collar on what one can pay um, sometimes there's a requirement for a fairness opinion and if the scale of that acquisition is such um, there is a requirement for a majority vote from all unrelated unit holders so there's a significant amount of protection for those unrelated unit holders that comes from uh, the regulations that SEBI put together. I mentioned that I just touch upon the uh, fees that a manager would generally charge and what uh, again has come through in India, which again is good for uh, investors. If you compare on the right hand side, you can see uh, some typical fee structures for managers of REITs around Asia. Um, and you see that on the comparative basis on the two listed REITs that are here in India. So um, three, three, or uh, I, th I think ours is 3% of the top line rentals um, and a performance fee, which is linked to distribution. So for us, that together equates to approximately 3.2% uh, um, of the top line. If you see on the right hand side across Asia, there are additional fees, base fees, acquisition fees, divestment fees. Those obviously will tend to push up the overall uh, leakage and uh, suppress the return to unit holders. So the rationale in India has been to keep the fee base really at a cost recovery level it isn't a pure cost recovery, but it's at that level so that the value flows up to the unit holders. Who can invest? Uh, just like the sponsors can be uh, foreign or domestic, um, any investor from any jurisdiction is permitted. Um, minimum lot size, and that's something that we're uh, speaking to uh, uh, SEBI about is that lot size something that can be reduced because of course that um, that does put a bar on the smaller retail in investors and of course that in turn has an impact on liquidity um, of the of the stock in the market um, we're listed on both NSE and, and BSE um, and uh, you can buy clearly pre uh, pre IPO if you're qualified uh, post IPO in the normal matter through the DMAT account. Um, summarizing what we see as the the pros and cons of 
a REIT versus direct investment, meaning buying and owning uh, real estate itself versus equity shares. And I'd I'd kind of just say equity shares. You're really in the in the India universe. You're really talking about um, the the large scale developers that you'd know of their names, um, and they will be developing both office and retail and residential generally. They'll be across all asset classes. Uh, development is a much higher risk activity anywhere in the world. And also, of course, in India, um, you know, there are land title risks, there are approval risks, uh, there are um, market risks uh, and execution risks. So clearly that risk return needs to uh, be balanced to reflect those risks. So buying that real estate equity uh, business, um, it, it's it's perhaps a riskier uh, business and therefore you would want a, a better return. Um, yeah, direct investment in real estate, owning your own real estate, um, and I, whether that be uh, at a personal level or an, in, as, at, a, at a more corporate investment level, clearly it's large, illiquid, uh, challenging perhaps to 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 sell in difficult markets, um, and it's very tax inefficient. Um, the, the, I suppose you could look one significant advantage, and the reason a lot of people like it is that often you can get leverage into the uh, investment equation, significant leverage. Um, and that, of course, has its benefits on the way up and its, its uh, risks on the way down. The, the REIT unit, uh, it, I think, is it's about the fact that it's small scale, it's liquid, you can get in and get out um, very quickly. Although, as I mentioned, being the first in new REIT, that liquidity is something that we're trying to build up in the market. The key um, element I think that's worth, uh, we'll go, go on to it in a while, is the dividends are tax exempt. So it's a very attractive um, investment from that perspective. Let me just, Go, go on to um, a, a very uh, graphic and quick comparison on historical performance, um, both at a, a, a generic level against the S&P, um, but also I'll, I'll show you some uh, international REITs against their local indices. So uh, you can see that REITs have had a, a, an absolutely amazing run since uh, the GFC and before. Um, a key component to that is that uh, you know, low interest rates obviously benefit um, um, real assets that you can have leverage into. So um, it, it has been a very positive run. Low interest rates are very helpful in that regard. These are international numbers. They're not, uh, they, they obviously wouldn't include uh, Indian numbers. Um, and then if you look at those returns by market, these cover US, Japan, um, UK, Singapore, India, and the, the, the blue boxes are from the time of that IPO initially. Boston Properties is the largest REIT in the world. Um, you can see a pattern of outperformance of that domestic index, the, the generic um, a domestic index. So, so for here, you know, we'd look at the Sensex, Singapore, Straits Times, uh, and so on. But a, a good uh, track record over a prolonged period of time, and that's because you have uh, an underlying asset which is throwing off income, uh, but is also uh, that rental often is growing either. Uh, inherently within the portfolio, or you're able to add uh, new properties to the portfolio, which generate uh, additional NOI, net operating income, which increases your, um, uh, your, your quarterly or six monthly distributions, and it increases the underlying asset base. So in some respects, you can, you can look at a REIT, uh, particularly in Asia, 
uh, and particularly in India, as a total return type of story. It's neither pure income, uh, nor is nor is it a pure equity. Um, and that, we feel, is one of the, the appeals. The other appeal that I mentioned is the taxability. And I, I'll just very quickly go through this, because uh, I know the audience will be interested in this. Generally, the distributions that are coming out on a quarterly basis are coming out in one of three different forms. So if you recollect the structure where you have the SPVs at the base, um, at times the REIT will in inject uh, debt into those SPVs. Let's say um, it's to uh, build a new building. So the REIT can inject into the SPVs, the SPVs will pay interest back to the trust. That interest is taxable uh, here in India. Um, so that's one component. The dividend component, uh, which comes out of the trust, that is not taxable. So there's no tax on REIT distributions. And clearly uh, on redemption, so the repayment of capital, there's no tax on that. And the examples, which the 45, 45, 10, distribution, that, that is not fixed. So this is just an illustrative um, mix. And clearly, the most tax effective way that you can um, uh, issue distributions would be to maximize uh, your distributions uh, and redemptions, and because the, the interest component is taxable. Um, but we just put those 45, 45, 10 as an illustration about if you had that mix, these type of investors uh, would end up with an implied rate of tax that you can see there in the column. So uh, when the regs were brought in, it was clearly part of the objective was to attract foreign capital uh, into the Indian market. So you can see non-resident investors um, are, are you know, right down there with that implied rate of 2.5. And clearly, if you reduce the proportion of interest that's being paid and increase the proportion of dividend, that implied rate will fall further. Um, the, uh, this, this can be a very attractive uh, method, method of investment for um, HNI individuals because, of course, today those HNIs, their income is being taxed at a, a marginal rate of, of 42 odd percent. Um, so you know, there are a number of ways that this can, from an income perspective, really produce something that's very tax efficient. Um, and then I mentioned earlier on the, the, uh, the overall historic performance. This is how um, cap rates for the two India listed REITs, um, Embassy REIT and Mindspace, which is promoted by um, the K. Raheja uh, family, um, how the cap rate has, has compressed over a period of time. Um, and you can see that spread which I think today is sitting at a, a, a about uh, 140 bips um, over the, the government uh, GSEC. That is normally how people would look at the, the, um, the return profile that they're looking for. And clearly, um, the higher the spread, um, the more attractive uh, the market sees, sees it at. Um, you, you know, here, this is showing the yield that we're trading at, um, and that spread does bounce around uh, between, uh, on this diagram, 60 to 150 bips on, on the yield. And the, the reason that people will take that is that they're looking at this in some ways like a bond-like uh, income with the potential for an equity-like growth. So. I, I think that's kind of my intro. I've probably taken a little bit more time than I should have. So I'll pause there and I'll hand it back to um, Bala so that he can bring uh, Jaya in with some, some Q&A and, and discussion. So I'll stop sharing now and hand it back.
his thoughts. I have a quick question for you. How do you find the um, how do you find the uh, uh, regulatory environment in India compared to uh, uh, both emerging markets and uh, uh, developed markets? Yeah. Okay, I, you can hear me. Um, so, so one, we we consistently say, and we've been interacting with the authorities for a number of years prior to listing, um, that SEBI uh, in particular uh, have done a really um, great job in framing up these regulations. I, I think you know SEBI have been very much looking after independent um, unit holders on on the trust. Um, it's taken longer perhaps than we would have liked, but I think it's better to be cautious than to um, have the, uh, the the platform fail. Um, they did a good job, great job, I think, in looking to Singapore, which is in many respects the model of corporate governance for, for lots, of, lots of us would recognize that. And, and in some respects copied and pasted those regs and then amended them to look after the India uh, scenario. So I think we would say um, they've done a great job. There, there are a couple of issues that we'd like to see um, maybe maybe now that we've proven over the last six quarters, um, I think we've distributed about 370 million US, I think it's about 2,700 odd crores. Um, we would like to see that lot size being able to reduce so that more domestic and retail investors could participate. Um, so that's something that we're, you know, we, we would like that to be um, uh, perhaps relaxed. The, the other thing that feedback we do get is that from international investors is that it, it is quite challenging sometimes to get the accounts open so that if institutional investors are looking to make investments, sometimes it, they find it quite quite difficult and maybe a little bit bureaucratic to get those accounts open. It takes longer than they would like. But I would say generally very positive. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, Jerry Balan, over to you. Could you please share your thoughts on Malaysia's journey, uh, which started a bit earlier than what India did in the, in the, in the REIT area, and, and share with you your experience and thoughts as to where it is and how, if you can compare with uh, where we are here in India. Over to you, Jerry Balan. Sorry. Thank you and good evening, Bala. Uh, greetings from KL again. Uh, Mike, thank you for that excellent presentation. I've learned a lot about Indian REITs in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, I think what I'll do is uh, I've, I've jotted out some points and just to compare and contrast what's happening in India versus um, uh, uh, what's happening in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia, the REIT market actually started in 1989 as what Mike had mentioned and it failed. And the reason why it failed initially was uh, due to the uh, lack of tax transparency. So the regulators changed the rules in 1999 and um, the first read under the new rules started in 2003. And now we have about 20 reads listed uh, on the Malaysian Stock Exchange. Market capitalization is about uh, just over uh, 10 billion US dollars. Uh, we are a small market compared to India, and I expect very soon uh, will be uh, India will have a lot more uh, given the size of the economy and the pace of your economic growth. Uh, but some things that are interesting that I noticed that the uh, REIT structure are almost identical. Um, I know that in India you have SPVs, in Malaysia the REITs don't have SPVs. Uh, in fact, if you do use an SPV, the regulator wants to know why. They discourage partial ownership of assets. They expect the REIT to own 100% of the asset. Uh, RPTs are, of course, uh, frowned upon. But, you know, an interesting point uh, from a REIT manager's perspective is that, you know, I, I note um, it is difficult to buy uh, yield accretive uh, properties, which means that, you know, the new... Compared to the share price, otherwise it's difficult to raise capital. And um, it always helps when there is a sponsor. 
first instance, I, I think in embassy case, there is a sponsor uh, behind it who can build, develop, incubate, and then, you know, uh, uh, put in the assets uh, at the right time. Uh, otherwise, it will be difficult to buy assets uh, from the capital markets. Uh, I think uh, I noticed the uh, uh, chart that Mike had shown, you know, interest rates in India also have dropped significantly and yields are competing with the fixed income market or bond market for assets. You know, it's sort of like a, um, a challenge over there. In fact, since 2017, there's not been a new read on the Malaysian market simply because it's cheaper to tap the bond market than to uh, 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 list the assets through a read structure. The other interesting point that I note is that in India, uh, you can do up to 20%, the REIT can take up to 20% uh, assets under construction, whereas in Malaysia it's 10%, a little bit more conservative. Uh, the other point that Mike didn't bring up, and I'm quite curious to understand the Indian um, um, governance structure, in Malaysia REITs need to be valued uh, on guidelines annually, and every three years, we need to change the valuer, we can't use the same valuer um so that'll be interesting to know uh what's the regime or how how things work in india uh, besides that uh in malaysia when you list a read there needs to be a cornerstone sponsor someone who's going to be responsible for the read over and above the uh, the manager so usually you'd find that at the onset a sponsor owns 20 30 40 percent of the read units i i assume from, from that would that may be the same in India. Uh, one thing unique in Malaysia is increasingly most of the assets that are being issued uh, or being listed are Sharia compliant. Uh, Malaysia being a Muslim majority ma uh, country, and uh, Bank Negara uh, or Central Bank has done a, a fantastic job in creating a Sukuk market. And with that, there's a lot of demand for Sharia compliant assets. So most REITs today tend to be uh, Sharia compliant uh, as opposed to the conventional uh, product since there's more demand from the investor base because conventional investors can buy Sharia compliant assets but not, not the other way around. Um, the other point is that um, we have a very developed uh, fixed income market and the fixed income market in Malaysia is almost 100% of GDP. So what you find is that, you know, when the fixed income markets yields are maybe about 100 to 150 bips lower than what a REIT investor would look for, um, unless you're developing your assets and incubating them before you put it into the REIT, it'll be quite challenging to buy uh, assets from third parties in this current environment of low interest rates. Um, the other interesting thing that I note is that uh, India, um, there is no withholding tax in, of dividends. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, in Malaysia, individuals uh, have a withholding tax of 10%, corporates 24%, and unless you're a tax exempt investor, then uh, uh, you would enjoy a uh, 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 tax exempt on the withholding tax. Um, the last one is uh, Malaysia is trying to promote, most Malaysian REITs have uh, also trying to go outside of Malaysia and buy non-Malaysian assets uh, to uh, some degree of success. Uh, uh, there's uh, REITs like YTL REIT who have bought hotels. Um, there's some Malaysian REITs that are looking to buy industrial properties in Australia and UK. Yet to be seen how successful they are, they replicate the Singapore REIT done very well by doing and the reason being is just the difference between markets like uh, UK and Australia versus the expected yields in Malaysia. Uh, why they're looking outside of Malaysia is just if you have to scale, there's just not enough product in Malaysia at, at this current point in time. Or read, uh, read, read quality uh, product for, for, for the manager to buy. So that would be a, a quick uh, comparison or, or contrasting of what Mike's presentation and uh, my observations of uh, what there are in Malaysia today. 
Uh, thank you, Jay Balan. Thank you for uh, you know uh, helping us understand uh, the Malaysian REIT market and how it compares with India. Michael, uh, when, before we start the question and answer, could you please address uh, Jay Balan's question about valuation of REITs and is there a regulatory requirement that you have to value the assets periodically? Yeah, it actually, uh, it was an omission on my part. That that is there. Um, it's it's pretty much the same. We have to do it every six months. And yes, the valuer needs to be changed uh, once every three years. So it's it's very much the same. Okay. And again, right. that's, to, that's reported uh, as part of our quarterly and, and six monthly uh, earnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just going to jump into the Q&A. There are a few questions that have come and, and I'm just going to have both of you respond to it. The first one is the obvious one. Uh, with the COVID situation, we are all experiencing, uh, you know, changes in how we work, particularly in India, the two REITs that are publicly traded are office REITs. Um, so how do you see the COVID situation affecting um, REITs uh, presently and going forward? And I realize that, uh, Michael, your REIT might be um, having more um, uh, space already leased out. So it may not be as big a problem, but is it, is it a challenge for growth of the REIT sector, particularly the office REIT sector? Uh, Michael, first you, and then hopefully, Jay, you could uh, chime in on your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I'll go quickly on that. Um, I mean, naturally, there's an impact, but the Indian office sector is primarily catering to international companies, and within that, technology companies, either product or services, and on top of that, as next to it, is the concept of global captive centers. So international companies who no longer outsource, but they do offshore. So the, those three broad buckets are really the core of our tenant base. And that is the type of occupier that is supporting the Indian office market and therefore the REIT market. Yes, where there have been domestic facing companies, whether those be international companies or domestic, but domestic facing businesses, uh, that they have found things challenging for sure. And as with all across the world, um, COVID and the last year has perhaps pushed some of the smaller, more fragile businesses across the, across the edge. Um, but we, we believe from our existing occupier base um, that the world is only getting more connected with technology and technology is driving businesses all over the world more and more. There's been many reported uh, date, much reported data around the bring forward of technology spend. Um, and we believe that that and many analysts and, and, and companies believe that that's actually going to benefit the Indian um, uh, technology players, and those are our, our type of occupiers. So rather like the GFC, after that, we saw a significant surge coming to India of these global captive centers who were outsourcing uh, before, who then started to offshore and create their own businesses here. So um, we, we think the future is positive. What is happening, and it, it, the REIT market is making uh, the progression to fewer, more institutional, uh, perhaps higher quality asset owners and developers, it's accelerating that trend and transition. So um, we, we think that there'll be less supply in the market. The type of supply that will be there will be higher quality um, and so on. So we, we feel that the, 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 the future is, is positive. Jay, your thoughts on the uh, COVID impact on the REIT sector? Sorry. Uh, well, in Malaysia, I think the sector that has been hit um, uh, earlier and harder uh, is the hotel sector, I, I suppose, like anywhere else in the world. Um, and then the retail sector. Uh, Malaysia, strangely enough, um, the uh, retail REITs were uh, still performing very well despite of e-commerce. But what I think COVID-19 has done is it's just um, induced uh, 
uh, or accelerated uh, behavioral change so much that um, the retail sector is now feeling the pinch with uh, you know retailers asking for discounts and um, uh, uh, rent leave uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the office sector in, in, in Malaysia, I think uh, very similar to what uh, uh, Mike had mentioned, uh, most of the grade A offices uh, are okay. They are doing well uh, simply because of the quality of their uh, tenants and the covenants they have. But uh, those with grade B uh, uh, tenants uh, are starting to feel the shock with uh, tenants talking about wanting to leave, uh, downsizing. Uh, and I think COVID-19 is uh, not so much the disease itself, but it just forced businesses to take a hard view, uh, internal hard view of their businesses. And um, that's causing a dislocation in, in, in that uh, weaker quality properties and you know managers who own that uh, have a tall order to uh, get get it back to shape mm -hmm. yeah can i can i just point sure. something out by a follow on from jaya you know it's very interesting i absolutely agree with jaya about um, you know retail and, and and hospitality really hit hard by by covid but to to illustrate the point about the indian office sector and these global captives um, we've got two tenants, I, I won't name them, but US listed companies in the specializing in the retail sector in the US. And because they embarked on a journey of um, digital transformation and a move to what they call omni-channel retailing a few years ago, if you look at their results over the last one year, they've absolutely flown right. through. Right. So a retailer in the US with a lot of its um, tech support work, its, its e-commerce business is being supported in India. Actually, those businesses are doing well and probably one would say that's a trend that's going to continue. Um, and so that helps our sector. Um, yeah, Michael, I, I have a related question to that. Um, the two listed REITs in India are office REITs. I guess that's a low-hanging fruit in terms of getting a REIT floated in India. Um, there are large uh, demand for office space, particularly due to the offshoring trend that we had in the last uh, couple of decades. Yeah. Um, do you see uh, the Indian market branching out to have REITs away from uh, office space, uh, maybe where housing is being talked off and maybe other forms of real estate uh, uh, investment trusts? And secondly, do you think that the challenge um, for somebody like Embassy and uh, a mind space is that that you're so focused and concentrated or dependent on overseas um, sort of entities setting up office in India that if that trend were to reverse then then there would be a challenge in terms of finding uh, replacement tenants for your space. Yeah. So um, you know, just dealing with the first one, I, I think yes, uh, there will be other REITs in due course. Um, people are talking about about it, logistics and warehousing is a clear potential one there, um, and data center uh, REITs in due course, although, I mean, the, the first wave on that will be the development of data centers because India is very much underserved in the data center space, but you would expect that those uh, would come. I, I, personal opinion, I think residential REITs are a long way away. Um, it's harder, harder to see that. Um, yeah, you know, clearly the office market in India is supported by, if not driven by, uh, overseas companies. I'll just give give you give you a, 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 an example. In, in the last six and a half years, um, a city like Bangalore and and you know other cities like Hyderabad or Chennai would would have similar data, but Bangalore's the biggest office absorption market in India. In, in, the, in the last six years, Bangalore's absorbed more office space than Shanghai, Beijing, and Hong Kong combined. Oh, wow. You, you know, I think people really uh, aren't clear about where India sits from an absor office absorption perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yes, the business is dependent upon uh, international companies and or 
the export of technology services. But that, you know, we see that as a great strength in a world that is becoming more dependent on technology, not less. So actually, and again, if you look at some of the NASCOM data that NASCOM uh, had on their website recently that they see next five years, you know, including this year, 13% CAGR growth uh, in, in, uh, in the turnover of their membership. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we actually see an increase in demand, not, uh, not it going the other way. But clearly it is dependent on, the office market is primarily dependent on the exports of technology related services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that should be continually encouraged. So what I refer to as the NASCOM industries, they are our typical customer, whether they're international businesses or domestic businesses. And sure. you know they are a great employer in India. I think there's 4.2 million people employed directly in those, but the multiplier is about 3x of that mm -hmm. or indirect employment. Mm -hmm. So it, it would have a you know it, it, any change to that would have um, a positive or negative impact on many aspects of the way in which um, the Indian economy works. Sure. Uh, thank you for your comments, Michael. Um, unfortunately, as we are getting warmed up and uh, going deeper into this topic, I'm told we are out of time. So we might have to have another session scheduled uh, so we can uh, deal with all the questions that came and more interesting aspects of how the REIT market in India is going to shape up. But let me extend my thank you to Michael Holland and Jayabal and Parasingam for taking their time to be with us and share their thoughts um, uh, for, on the second India Fixed Income Conference. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And back to you, Ravi. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.